Welcome to Think Tech on OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Elisa Onishi. In our show tonight, we'll cover the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum's legislative briefing that took place at the State Capitol Auditorium in January. This was more than informational. It was a point-counterpoint of issues and controversies facing the Clean Energy Initiative today. The proceedings were convened by Denny Kaufman, chair of the House Energy Committee. I would like to welcome my fellow legislators, government officials, and the public to the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum's annual legislative briefing. This year's briefing theme is the state of clean energy, issues and controversies. During last year's session, we worked on undersea cable legislation that became linked to the big wind proposals on the islands of Lanai and Molokai. We worked on biofuel tax credits and the util utilization and allocation of the barrel tax funds. These topics will continue in our 2012 session and they are part of today's discussion. Sharon Moriwaki, co-chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, then reported on the forum's TV series, Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy. So what we as the forum started looking at this, we wanted to go public. And what better way than television? We sought and found a partner in Hawaii News Now, and with the help of Linda Brock, who was a producer, director of the series, we put together a six-show series in 2011, starting in February and going to the uh, end of December. And they played, they aired 24 times last season. And with the support of nine underwriters for the production, we broadcast the first ever six-show series on clean energy. And it, we entitled it Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy. The state being the status and the state being the model, hopefully, for not only the nation but the world. So now I'd like to present to you the highlights of Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Mike Hamnett, co-chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, then reported on the state of clean energy in Hawaii. Uh, the long-term costs of, uh, of uh, oil are going to continue to go up and stay up. Uh, to minimize the uh, impact of this on our economy and the drag that it puts on, we're going to have to turn to renewables. And uh, we're starting to make progress. I mean, I know when we first started the forum in 2002, uh, and for the first couple of years, it was a lot of talk, and uh, we didn't see much uh, steel in the ground. Um, the uh, cost of electricity in Hawaii is driven largely by the cost of fuel, but I think the game has changed. I think with the growth of uh, demand in China and India, uh, the long-term prospects for oil prices is that the, the trajectory is up. And whether you believe in the end of uh, oil or not, the fact is the global, global demand has changed significantly and prices are going, to, are going to continue to go up and stay up. Carl Friedman of Haiku Design and Analysis then reported on the forum's Clean Energy Accountability Metrics Project. I want to give a little status report on something that is non-controversial, or we're trying to be at any rate, uh, and that is to, uh, it's a project sponsored by the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum to try and develop some metrics and status reports to uh, keep track, basically, of how well we're doing in our transition to clean energy. We're trying to come up with metrics and ways to report on progress that are uh, correct, that are accepted and res respected by the various stakeholders and understandable to the lay general public. So it needs to be presented in a way that is uh, understandable as well as being correct. And also feasible in terms of how much it's going to cost to develop the metrics. What's next uh, is what we're currently involved in, refining the metrics and coming up with cost and feasibility. And next we'll try and get some funding. Then we began the issues and controversies part of the program, first with a panel on the issue of the true costs of renewable energy, featuring Josh Strickler of the PUC and Robbie Ahm of Hawaiian Electric Company. The reason you look at, say, a wind farm on Lanai is the wind farm price is 13 cents, the amortized 30-year price of the cable is 8 cents. The combined effect of those would give us 200 or 400 megawatts of wind at 21 cents over a 20-year period against an oil price 
that goes crazy on us. So from a siting basis of wind farm on Molokai or Lanai may never happen. You know, there's permitting and other issues. But financially, why you would do it in this state is really obvious because the offset to oil would be dramatic. And if you look at all of the commodities that we look at for renewable energy, again, they're either underneath right now or close. And nobody believes it was in the oil business that $132 a barrel is where it stops. I mean, that's $132 a barrel. Make it 150 and most things will be under it. So the point about renewables, to just reemphasize what Josh said, is renewables save us money. Renewables against oil, even when you add in the infrastructure costs, they save us money. When people say renewables are too expensive, they're just flat wrong. And that's why Hawaii should make this conversion um, no matter what. On top of which, that money spent here, not somewhere overseas. We continued with the panel on the issue of solar tax credits to advance clean energy, featuring Representative Pono Chong and John Yoshimura of Solar City. We've got a lot of resources before us. We've got wind, geothermal, solar, biofuels. You know, each one of these uh, uses or each one of these types of renewable energies has a place in the portfolio. And for the solar industry, the tax credit is just so critical. And the one thing I want to leave with you today is that for the amount of money we spend on the solar tax credit, our state gets more in return. We get more wealth in return than the amount of money that we're spending on the solar tax credit. Uh, you know, the federal government and the state of Hawaii has a system of, or programs for uh, investment tax credits. And to me, they are two of the most successful programs our federal and state government. Overall, the state has to balance its budget. Many of you have seen it in the paper regarding furlough Fridays for schools, the $1.3, $2.1 .1 billion shortfall. We're again in a shortfall. People have to understand tax credits are expenditures. We often don't look at them the same, but Department of Education, Human Services for Medicaid and our seniors have to come before the legislature every year and justify their budget. This tax credit does not. It's open-ended. There's no cap and there's no sunset. You could use $100 million in tax revenue and not have to come before us. But the seniors have to for Medicaid, our children have to for DOE. Is that fair? Then we had a panel on the issue of the underwater cable featuring Mark Glick, Hawaii State Energy Administrator, and Doug McLeod, Maui Energy Commissioner. The uh, position of uh, DBED and the administration is that uh, cable is really crucial to us meeting our long-term renewable energy portfolio goals and the ability to really move forward a clean energy economy. And it, what it uh, can do is provide uh, the greatest uh, avenue for providing a, 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 a receptacle for all of the renewable energy sources in the state and also to meet the considerable demands uh, that Oahu has and working together in doing that in a collaborative way. We also believe it will uh, immediately uh, levelize and reduce neighbor island costs. So it's an important uh, issue. It's an important part of uh, the overall renewable energy agenda. If we had the benefit of hindsight, I think we would have articulated much better than we have the purpose of the cable. And that was to really provide a system that could uh, be immediately link us to Maui and be designed in a way that would move us as rapidly as feasible to the Big Island. First one here is exactly what Mark was saying. What is the real purpose of this cable? Is it just a way to boost the RPS percentages for HECO? And that was what Robbie was explaining. You would definitely have that result. This, we're not here to argue that wind power doesn't work or that it's not effective or it's not cost effective. When you look at HECO's RFP, they use this language and they say this is a stand alone inter-island cable system. And we would say that compare this notion of a standalone system with these two extension cords out to Molokai and Lanai. It's not a standalone system that way. 
here's what we really are here to say in a positive sense. Uh, Mark is right. We are all much closer on this issue than, than people may realize. We've been very active working with the state, with the county of Hawaii, and, and actually the message you're gonna hear from all of us is that the cable ought to be a way to look at bringing geothermal into the mix in the future. We continued with a panel on the issue of locally grown biofuel and the case of Aina Koapono, featuring consumer advocate Jeff Ono and Mel Chiogioji of Aina Koapono. We can see even with, within the next month or so, depending on what happens in Iran, you know, $200 oil. You know, can the Hawaii economy stand those kind of shocks? I would venture to guess we can't. So we need to do something about that. You know, the fact of the matter is that we can, in fact, Hawaii has the ability to mitigate some of that because we can home grow some of our fuel. The fact of the matter is today we've got about a half a million acres of land lying fallow doing nothing that could be put into production of, 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 of oil. You know, there's an argument going on that says, well, we ought to use this land for food. Well, every study I've read so far, including the University of Hawaii, has shown that the maximum amount of uh, land that we can use productively to create food is around 20,000 acres. So we've got almost a half a million acres here available to, to, to do energy production. You know, the rationale behind keeping this particular price confidential is that especially where you have a new technology, the feeling is that if you publish the price information, uh, it could result in a floor being established to other competitors. Uh, so rather than being a competitive, competitively priced industry, you'll have a floor being established uh, by, say, AKP's contract, and then everybody else coming in uh, a few pennies either above or below that. Our last panel was on the issue of the barrel tax and how it can be used to most effectively advance clean energy, featuring Marcus Oshiro, chair of the House Finance Committee, and Jeff Mikolina of Blue Planet Foundation. The legislature agreed two years ago that let's put a tax on our problem and fund our solutions with that. So they added a dollar to the barrel tax. There's already a five cent uh, tax that went to um, environmental remediation sort of things. Uh, and that was Act 73 in 2010. Of this, though, about 60% is diverted to the general fund. And that was sort of a last minute thing to fill a puka in, in, in the budget. Um, the overall idea was though, to tax oil and to fund clean energy initiatives and food security initiatives. So about 60% goes to the general fund, uh, some goes to the ag initiatives, and then a chunk goes to the energy office, energy security special fund, as well as HNEI and, and uh, some other uh, energy programs. Out of this, um, some programs at Department of Ag have been funded over the past year, and then through the uh, energy office, a number of things have been funded, but the main expenditure has been for personnel costs in this fiscal year, uh, simply because the ARRA money has gone away, uh, and that was largely funding the energy office over the past couple of years. The proposal that we discussed last year and that has been proposed uh, this year will be discussed is should we mend the barrel tax to take that 60 percent and, and divide it up between the food security and, and energy security um, initiatives, getting back to the original intent of the law. 2009, uh, we faced a $2.3 billion shortfall. Uh, in 2010, it was a $1.2 billion shortfall. And primarily, we had to make some hard choices, both in raising some revenues, um, using some non-general fund surplus funds, um, at the same time, also um, making some big cuts. And I, so this is what we did in Act 73 um, in, in 2010. Uh, we basically modified the uh, oil barrel tax of five cents a barrel, added a dollar to that, to a dollar and five cents, and and broke it out as, as follows: 15 cents for the Energy Security Special Fund, 15 cents for the Agriculture Development Food Security Special Fund, uh, 10 cents for the Energy Systems Development Special Fund, uh, five cents. The, the nickel for the barrel tax, and 60 cents on, a, on, a, on going to the general fund. And we did this primarily to ensure that we could balance our budget uh, uh, during these, these tough times. It ends in, sunsets in uh, June 30, 2015, so there is some finality to it. Closing remarks were delivered by Mike Gabbard, chair of the Senate Energy Committee. Uh, what to expect this session, and this is in, not in any particular order. First of all, we're going to be taking another look at SB 367, the Inner Island Transmission Cable Bill. It was good to get the input from uh, the panelists. SB 367 does not specify any technology or energy source. 
Uh, although it started as a bill for an inter island cable from Lanai and Molokai to Oahu, we amended it early on to apply to any inter island transmission cable. And we also put the PUC in charge of the process. Uh, secondly, I'm hopeful that we can continue preserving our solar tax credits uh, in this difficult economy to continue making solar more affordable. Uh, we're very hopeful that the PUC will uh, rule favorably on the on-bill financing uh, docket that's in front of them now. We'll be looking at authorizing the PUC to develop, adopt, and enforce reliability standards for electric systems and to oversee electric grid access through a third-party Hawaii electricity reliability administrator. Uh, this will be a big help in hopefully getting more distributed generation on the grid towards our goals of reducing our dependence on fossil fuels. All in all, this was a valuable discussion in that it identified issues and controversies and revealed multiple points and arguments for the consideration of the legislators and the public. Those who attended were pleased with the level of the discussion and the forum was pleased with the way it went since this is the kind of briefing that the forum believes will be most valuable in the legislative session. But the footage you've seen is from January, and now it's April, so let's check in with some of the people involved in the briefing for an update to account for some of the developments that followed in the interim. You know, from a policy standpoint, uh, the fact that one of the governor's top um, administrative bills this session is uh, Senate Bill 2785, which is uh, the cable bill, and which really only provides the opportunity for low-cost financing of such a system if it were to be um, RFP'd by a, a utility or uh, to be part of the future plans for renewable energy systems to provide it from off-island. Mm -hmm. You would need a, a cable, and this legislation provides the opportunity for it to be part of the rate base and therefore you can get low cost financing if you're a developer. That we see is just a simple uh, yet essential ingredient to helping move that agenda forward and the governor is, um, has made that a, a key initiative. And How's and, it doing? Uh, it actually um, receives the final, um, some of this may be dated information by the time this is heard, but um, the very last committee uh, on the uh, House side, uh, it's already gone through the Senate, it's moved over to the House. The very last committee is today, actually. And if it passes as we expect it to, I'm it, knocking will, wood. <laughs> yeah, it, will, it will go to conference. And it gave us an opportunity to talk about it uh, openly and transparently as a statewide interconnection concept and something that uh, will ultimately uh, give you the best opportunity of getting uh, our firm geothermal power from the Big Island to uh, Oahu. And then there's also a resolution that gives some policy guidance to the Public Utilities Commission, um, sort of requesting that they uh, open up some of the contracts with the existing power purchase agreements and, and un unhook them from the price of oil. So what, what was known as avoided uh, cost um, uh, contracts in the past, where the price of renewables would ride with the price of oil. Um, as opposed to the new way of doing it, which is you know setting a development price and then paying whatever that price is over time, and that's the preferable approach, obviously, because we know you know renewables over time are going to cost less than you know the fossil fuel generation. Uh, so why not just pay that cost as opposed to paying whatever the price of oil is for those renewables? We really don't uh, enjoy the benefit if it's just riding with oil. Uh, so this resolution would give some you know more guidance to the PUC and kind of give them permission to take action in that regard. Um, so we hope that that passes. As we go through this transition, plus we're paying, you know, so much for oil, uh, it's kind of the double whammy. And uh, people sometimes will conflate the, uh, the rising cost of oil with, well, wait a minute, but we're also making these investments in clean energy. Uh, and that's a real challenge because, I mean, the public perception about this stuff, if we lose and people start thinking, hey, we just can't afford clean energy, uh, we're really going to be set back. So. I think it's, uh, it's incumbent on us to really tell the story and make it clear that we're, it's going to take a little pain now, just like investing. You know, you're going to invest now, but you're going to reap the rewards for, uh, in Hawaii's case, for forever. Uh, a number of bills were introduced, um, most significantly one to take the 60% of the barrel tax, which currently goes to the general fund, and split that evenly among ag initiatives and energy initiatives. Um, we really had zero traction. Um, I think, you know, we were waiting for that, the council revenues, um, update in March, 
uh, which was positive, but not positive enough to think that they could, you know, direct this 14 million away from the general fund to those, um, to those other two um, areas. But, the, but the, I mean, this is one of the, a real frustrating one because we do, we have a carbon tax in place, uh, and it's it's it was well thought through. Let's tax the problem, use this to fund solutions. Uh, unfortunately, at the last minute, they took the 60 percent of it and directed it elsewhere. Um, we found broad public support for this policy. People are willing to pay a little bit, even with these high prices. People are willing to pay a little bit if they know it's going to help us make the transition off of oil. Uh, so I think we need to stay true to that. Um, have a tax. We have a dollar right now. Maybe even make it two dollars, uh, and then really focus on what we need to do to enable more renewable energy resources on our grid, and then in the transportation side too. So um, we're going to bring this up again next year, and and hopefully get get more traction. Now for a ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. ThinkTech's 4 to 5 p.m. weekday drive time radio series on KGU 760 AM continues this week, covering business, Asia, tech, energy, the arts, and government. Tune into 760 AM every Wednesday at 4 p.m. and raise your awareness on ThinkTech Radio. On April 26, the Hawaii Venture Capital Association and ThinkTech will present a luncheon panel program called Getting Around in Hawaii, The Press Weighs In on Rail, featuring remarks by Mayor Peter Carlisle and two panels of journalists who have been covering the subject. It's a part of our ongoing transportation series. Sign up for these programs on hvca.org. And now here's Bill Spencer, president of the Hawaii Venture Capital Association, with this week's Spensation. The companies that are truly uh, doing innovative things that uh, can't get investment capital elsewhere in Hawaii because there's no venture capital to speak of at the moment, they're struggling. And it's, it's a, a sad situation. Uh, really, um, you know, we, we had a, a group in the tech industry that worked so hard for well throughout the Lingle administration and worked against her efforts to bring 221 down. Uh, from even at the time she was originally inaugurated in uh, the latter part, the last part of 02, she was working, despite her promises to the contrary, she was working to bring it down. That was her most significant legacy. She killed it before it expired. Certainly in the minds of the public and, and the PR campaigns against it and the, you know, all the uh, accusations of fraud and abuse, which re really were never proven. Yeah. You know, a, f a fraction of the companies, if, if really any, were um, taken to task compared to all of the companies that did get seeded. And I think the, you know, the bottom line, though, is that uh, the follow-on capital is not there. But now there are a lot of companies that have been left in the lurch, and it's a, it's a real shame because uh, we need some home runs. We need to continue to show that uh, we have tech capacity and uh, it requires investment, a continual flow of investment, and we're not getting it. And we're actually further away from it than we were back in the early part of the, you know, the 2000s. Um, there was enthusiasm there. There were, there were, there were invigorated young people uh, who, who wanted to build a tech industry and, uh, and somehow 221 was the, the symbol, the icon of all of that. And it was a catalyst, there's no question about it. And, it. and yes, and it created investment capital, and it brought people here to, to be involved in tech companies. It raised their level of uh, experience, of training, of uh, involvement, 
and there was, uh, you know, the real makings of an industry. Those statistics were not inaccurate. There was an industry being formed right in front of our eyes. The loss of 221, you know, even though while it was happening, nobody could be sure exactly what the economic effects were and no, you know, the synergies, you know, and the ripple uh, into the economy. But now, looking back, we can tell. Well, we do know that that one and a half billion dollars was spent here in the economy. Uh, it was spent on employees. It was spent on goods and services. Uh, the the money didn't leave Hawaii. And the last few years, when the uh, investment capital reached its peak, were some of the worst years economically for the state and the country. So in many ways, it it kept things. Uh, going when tourism was down and all those other uh, sectors that we rely on were struggling. Though it won't happen again soon in Hawaii, many other states, many more states than previously, are adopting some form of tax-oriented incentive for investment in their tech sectors. Mm -hmm. I think 18 states now uh, have uh, some kind of program modeled after 221. Isn't that interesting? So yeah, this was uh, really ironic that we should, um, you know, give them the idea, give them the template, and then they have it and we don't have it. And that all happened during the Lingle administration. So she left us, uh, she left us without a tech industry. That's what happened. I'm afraid you're right, Jay. Yeah. Well, it all transmutes to energy. Let's see if we can do better on energy. I hope so. <laughs> we'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech, but first we want to thank our underwriters. Thanks to the Shiler Family Foundation, which supports a number of educational, cultural, and charitable organizations, including Think Tech. Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Miko on Maui and Helco on the Big Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company and CEO of CBI Polymers, a tech company in Hawaii. Okay, Lisa, that wraps up this week's edition of Think Tech. Remember, you can watch Think Tech on OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Elisa does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. You bet, Jay. For lots more Think Tech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on Think Tech on OC16, visit thinktechhawaii.com. Be a sponsor or a volunteer and help us reach Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. Thanks so much for joining us on Think Tech. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next weekly episode. I'm Elisa Onishi. Aloha, everyone.